so we are live now hello everyone good evening to all i am rakesh de from the team voices into the past or atit prabaho today we have suffered a great loss with the demise of great poet shankho ghosh and it's very unfortunate to us shankho ghosh was a colossus of bengal literature he always stood at the forefront whenever bengal faced a crisis we deeply mourn at the passing away of the great son of india now today we are extremely happy to have with us professor suchandra ghosh in our facebook live thank you ma'am for accepting our invitation and welcome to our page professor ghosh presently is the professor of the department of history of the university of hyderabad she specializes in early indian history with the focus on epigraphy and numismatics she broadly takes interest in the politico cultural history of northwest india early india's linkages with early south southeast asia indian ocean buddhist and trade network and the history of everyday life before joining the university of hyderabad she was the professor of the department of ancient indian history and culture of the university of calcutta professor ghosh has been recipient of fellowships and awards including the charles wallace visiting fellowship uk loy memorial grant for oriental studies by the royal numismatic society london and many others She has published over 60 essays in journals and books in India and abroad. She is the area editor of the Encyclopedia of Ancient History, Asia and Africa. Willie Blackwell. She is the author of Exploring Connectivity, Southeastern Bengal and Beyond: From the Oxus to the Indus, a Political and Cultural Study. She edited and co-edited issues in Agrarian History of India, Essays in Memory of Dishi Shortcut. subversive of sovereign across the seas the indian ocean port city experience etc besides she has also contributed several chapters and articles in reputed journals and books in 2017 professor ghosh has received the sabitri chandra shobha memorial prize of indian history congress for her book from the oxus to indus a political and cultural study published by paimas publication we are really very fortunate to have such an eminent person in our facebook live session and so without any further introduction we proceed to professor suchandra ghosh ma'am thank you ma'am once again proceed to you and over to you ma'am thank you very much rakesh for this generous introduction and i would like to thank the voyages into the past the organizers himadri in particular who constantly kept touch with me and uh, and i'm here today uh it is indeed a day of gloom and sadness for us because we lost one of the most important poet author uh, uh of of bengal and also of india and those of of us of my age or little elderly or a little younger we know that how shankar babu's poetry and prose sustained us through our difficult times to our happy times so it is um, very sad that uh, he had to give in today to the deadly disease uh, nevertheless uh, we have to keep our commitments and today i am going to speak to you on south asia in the kushana world exploring its socio economic network uh, first of all i would like to say that um, i i i intend to uh, discuss the uh, the topic into two parts uh, into two sections rather uh, after introducing the kushanas and uh, the kushanas uh, i'm talking mainly to the students today as i gather uh, so therefore uh, it is uh, it is important that uh, we uh, look at the kushanas uh, not from the point of view of rulers and others which is there in the textbook but i'm trying to understand uh, the society in which actually the kushanas uh, when the, the the nature of the society and the economic concerns uh, when the kushanas were ruling in south asia so the emergence uh, or the kushanas we can say that emerged into the history uh, via the we, we came to know about the kushanas for the first time via the chinese annals as a branch of the nomadic uhc i'm not going to into details of the descriptions but a preliminary introduction is required uh uhc tribes or confederacy 
and in contrast to the um, uh, steppe spectral nomads they were nomads and therefore the kushanas are a glare glowing example where we find that there was a transition from a nomadic life to sedentarization but having said that it is also true uh, that in contrast to the steppe spectral nomads members of the uh probably lived a semi sedentary oasis centered life way based on limited stock grazing and agriculture and probably used irrigation the nomads who would establish the kushana empire remained with the group called the greater uh or the ta uh which moved north and west entering the valley of the ili river and displacing the shoko population there uh, let me go back uh, to uh, the maps uh, i would like to uh, rakesh or himadri uh, i'm not being able to operate my powerpoint hello can you see can you see the maps can you see the maps yes ma'am it's visible we can see it it's okay fine yeah, it's fine so first of all um, let us look have a look at this map and when we look at it we find that the green patch is the kushan empire and we can see that it's a huge it extends from central asia to south asia and uh, the parts of south asia and contemporary to the kushanas were the han empire and the parthian empire and of course the roman empire then we come to the next map and here we can see the migration so the uh is actually moved from the region of han china and then came here uh here is sogdiana they came downwards came to bactria which was the seat of power and then finally moved into um, uh, the indian subcontinent so uh, uh, historically when we look at it we find that uh, the kushana empire remained with the uh, sorry uh, the kushana empire uh, were formed uh, when they were able to move into the bactrian region and rest control from the greek rulers who had already been weakened by the shockers the overthrow of the greco bactrians did not take long and by 128 127 bc when han envoy shankian made his diplomatic overtures to the greater uh they were already settled in northern bactria that is in modern afghanistan and beginning to extend their power southwards gujilok officers after the conquest of bactria had invaded ansi or the borders of the indo parthians conquered gaufu which is the kabul valley and destroyed puda which is called likely to be pushkalavati the peshawar region and jibin that is the kashmir region soon kujila kafisis new lands were known collectively as guishwang that is the new kushan empire was formed and bn mukherjee has given us an idea how the lower in this country was used as a springboard by the kushanas to enter into the indian subcontinent now when we look at this map there are uh, i hope you can uh, see it properly or let me zoom out a little bit so when you, there are two yellow lines one is the dotted lines which is the extended kushan empire and the broad yellow line tends to show the basic kushana empire so here you have bactria bamiyan surkotal uh, purushapura kandahar uh, these are karakoram ranges which i will talk to about a little uh, later and then we come this is the five indus river and then we come to mathura which was another stronghold of the kushanas in south asia and from there we have places in koshambi varanasi uh, then of course uh, shravasti all these places ujjaini sachi vidisha uh, these were all part of the larger uh, the kushana territory uh, it was not always a part of the kushana territory but it was a part of the larger kushana empire and he is herais also known as miaus uh, his uh, sculpture has been found from khaljayan which is in the central asian part of the kushan empire and we have his coin he said to be the first of the kweshi uh, uh but he was independent and then we come to the group 
of the Kushana rulers who ruled in India, which starts from Kujula Kutfesis. <coughs> the Kushana Empire in South Asia. Now, when we look at the Kushana Empire in South Asian history, we find that it is posited uh, between the two celebrated empires, the Mauryan Empire and the Gupta Empire. So the largest expanse of the Kushana Empire included, as I have shown earlier, uh, the regions of the modern states of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Northern India. Then there were small territorial kingdoms in Northern India, which came under the sway of the Kushanas. This is confirmed by the Bactrian inscription from Rabatak. We all know that the discovery of Rabatak inscription was phenomenal and it changed a lot into Kushana history. So Rabatak was located in the Baglan province of Afghanistan, in the northern Afghanistan and very near Surkotal. And it was Nicholas Sims Williams and Joe Crip who uh, in initially was the first person, Nicholas Sims Williams was the first person along with Joe Crip who studied the Rabatak inscription. And from the Indian side, it was B.N. Mukherjee who published the uh, Rabatak inscription. Now, uh, when we look at the Rabatak inscription, we find that it talks about uh, Kanishka first reign and the first year of Kanishka's reign and informs us that his commands were being obeyed in the following cities of Zagido, that is Saketo, Kozombo, Koshambi, Palibotro, and Srochampa. So the four cities are identified, uh, as I just with the Saketo, uh, Koshambi, which is near Allahabad, Patna, that is Pataliputra, and uh, Champa or Sri Champa in the Bhagalpur area. Mathura is not mentioned in Rabatak because it was already an important stronghold of the Kushanas. Impressive number of inscriptions issued by or uh, issued during the reign of the Kushana rulers has been found in these areas, Mathura in particular. These inscriptions, including the image inscriptions, are either official issues of Kushana rulers or mention Kushana rulers along with the names of their subordinate rulers and or functionaries or private uh, records of donations mentioning the reigning Kushana monarchs. So today, my source is actually these inscriptions, these donative records from which I'm trying to cull some information to understand the societal and economic network. The coins of the Kushana rulers also have been unearthed found as far as Eastern India beyond the direct territorial control of the Kushanas. Now, scholars, as I mentioned in the beginning also, that scholars have largely focused on the political and art history of the Kushana world. In case of studies of society on economy, uh, there are a lot of studies on the part of Central Asia, but South Asian part of the empire has not been factored in much, uh, even though there are enough possibilities of exploring these uh, aspects. Uh, B.N. Mukherjee had um, written a book called Mathura and its Society, where he talks largely of the Kushana influence. But other than that, we have chapters in books uh, which talk about uh, the society, for, but not, uh, but society or economy, uh, particularly society, did not get the privileged position that it deserves. So there are enough possibilities of exploring these aspects from the available sources, though the sources are meager. The Kushana realm had already become a formidable territorial power intent upon deriving economic gains out of controlling area and roads noted for long distance trade. Now, within the Kushan Empire, the society of South Asia was distinct and with the social complexities like the Varna system. So uh, one cannot compare the society of Central Asia under the Kushanas with the society of South Asia. Uh, the Varna system is very important here. And uh, our task is to see how far the donative records offer a window uh, and uh, allow us to understand the nature of the society and economy. So as I, uh, as I was thinking that keeping in, um, this in mind, I would try to examine today a select few donative records of the period to highlight the donors and the economic concerns of the Kushana realm in South Asia, 
there were people from various ethnic groups among whom there were elites as well as ordinary men so this presentation i intend to divide into two sections in the first section i would highlight the trading networks and hubs of the kushana realm particularly in the context of the sites connected to south asia which brought prosperity to the kingdom the intention is to show that only a prosperous kingdom can also offer such kind of donative records now <coughs> in the beginning let us look at the trade and trade routes of during the kushan times the kushanas were able to control and manage the trade system due to their critical geopolitical position in the region long distance routes traversed by the nomads of earlier ages were utilized by the kushanas and functioned as economic and cultural portals between the ancient power holders possessing not only rare land routes and extensions of the silk route but also their conquest of india they could access the maritime routes that could facilitate an infrastructure for direct trade with the romans now if you look at this map sorry then we find that we have this uh, riverine route uh, which is across the indus river uh this one this red one and then you have the also the land routes which goes into aragorsia and it comes from uh the central asian uh, route of or the silk route then we have other routes which can move into the uh the inner part of the south of the indian subcontinent and move towards pataliputra and further east so these and the the route across the indus then comes to the port of barbaricon and then it goes further up to the persian gulf area and reaches the ports of the persian gulf so therefore there was a kind of a control over these uh, regions continuing east from gandhara along the northern road traders could cross the punjab plains which functioned as a borderland between gandhara and north india although not nearly as challenging as the khyber pass or the hindu kush the five punjab rivers flowing uh, through this region still posed a formidable obstacle under the kushanas a large tract was politically united and so vibrant urban centers like mathura and ujjain in the interior came under the sway so here is uh, mathura uh, these two centers acted as lucrative hinterland for the port of barugaza and were also connected to important trade routes like the uttarapatha and the dakshinapatha quickly i'll go through one or two maps so here this is the map of uttarapatha uh, this is taken from jason nilis and here we can see that taxila is located so the uttarapatha is not actually a straight route it has lot of capillary routes and these capillary routes crossed uh uh reached mathura then went to baira uh, vairat then crossed the malwa corridor came downwards so there were a uh, immense number of capillary routes which helped in the and since the entire in the in the process of trade and e-commerce and since the entire region was under a single political authority it was easy for the merchants and the monks to travel across this road without any kind of hindrance now coming to this uh, barugaza and barbaricon so here is the port of barugaza and here is the port of barbaricon they had a very strong hinterland in paitan and this uh, is not our imagination we have periplus of the eritrean sea which talks about that things are moving from paitan tagara to the port town of barugaza and then it also talks about pushkalavati in the north so therefore the linkages uh of mathura uh with ujjain then again the linkages of barugaza with ujjain or ozini becomes very uh you clear and therefore when uh, kanishka actually conquered this region ozini it was a great conquest so because this entire region became a part of the uh, very important network so ports like barbaricon on the indus and barugaza on the narmada were also involved in the trade through the silk road so they were connected with the silk road and if we look at this map we find that here is barbaricon here is barugaza and then uh, there this is the silk road 
and through the Silk Road and then coming through the Indus in another essay, I have actually discussed the, the entirely on the how this route functioned. Uh, so they reached the different ports of Barbarican and Barugaza and then how they walked through the hinterlands. So this was the normal route for supplies to northwestern India. Some silk continued on its way by sea to Spasino Karax. Spasino Karax is, uh, is a port of the Persian Gulf, a very important. Here we have Apologos and Spasino Karax, and uh, from the port of Barbaricon. At Barbaricon, silk cloth and yarn were available, and all these were coming from China. Uh, we have reference in Periplus, which talks of Chinese pelts as a merchandise for the return cargo. And section 49 of the Periplus refers to the exports from the port of Barugaza to the Eastern Roman world. So among the items of export, Chinese cl silk cloth and silk yarn are mentioned. So in a later section in 64, the Periplus, it is also said that from Thina, that is China, silk floss, wool and yarn are shipped via ba uh, Bactria to Barugaza. In the same way, it might have come to Barbaricon through the Indus. Both Barbaricon and Barugaza had a huge hinterland in northwestern India, uh, which I just mentioned. And so we can see Taxila and other places. Uh, Jean Rouleau observes that the main path of the Silk Road uh, during the first two centuries uh, coursed through Central Asia to the Indus Valley. Going directly to the sea coast along the Indus or detouring through Mathura, it connected with the Roman world. Here again, this is a closer view of the different uh, areas and we will come to this a little later. Apart from the maritime connectivity, the heart of the Kushana realm, Bactria was also connected to the celebrated Silk Road. Under the Kushanas, Bactria became the international hub of the Silk Roads where people throughout Eurasia traveled bringing goods and ideas on their way to China, India, Parthia, or Rome. So, and we all know that Bactria was one of the most important center of the Kushana, uh, of the Kushana power, Kushana empire. And therefore the Rabata conscription is written in Bactrian. So Chankian's description of Dakshia that is Bactria under the hegemony of the UHC indicates that the country uh, thrived economically. Actually, he, uh, when uh, if we look at the uh, description in Ho Han Shu, we find that he talks about, he marvels actually at the, the merchants re which return from India laden with go uh, goods uh, from as far away as his native China. Then he, he also talks about uh, some specific kind of bamboo and cloth from Southwest China's shoe region, which was selling well in the markets of Bactria. So the whole network uh, fascinated him. In the, so, and he, uh, we, this is a very important source for understanding Kushana history. A significant uh, site of the Kushana world was Begram. Uh, Begram is situated at the confluence of the Gurband and the Panshi River. Here is Begram, if you can see. And there are uh, the rivers which actually uh, crisscrosses the region. And to the south, the, we have the Kodaman Plains uh, stretch all the way to Kabul. So there was, I'm not going to the de geographical details, but the fact remains that Begram was very well connected through the rivers and also the land routes. So they could uh, reach the plains of ancient Bactria along the sites such as Surkotal and Bactra, which was also the capital of ancient Bactria. This is present mazar -e sharif So these passes of the Western Hindu Kush mountains were renowned lines of communication between Bactria and India, which carried along their paths not only the people and materials, but also cultures of the attendant thereon. So these passes also connected the area of Begram with stations along the Silk Roads from China to the Mediterranean. The Kushan Palace at the summer capital, and it was the summer capital of the Kushanas, yielded two rooms filled with an array of items from countries that participated in the trade and commerce of the Silk Roads. Chinese lacquer boxes, bronze Hellenistic statuettes, Roman glass, Indian ivory carvings. Indeed, Begram is famous for its ivories and bones. Just a quick look at the things. Uh, I've just uh, uh, put a few pieces and uh, this is the Begram hoard. 
And so you have ivory, then this is a beautiful piece of ivory, then the glasses, here are the vases. So uh, the, uh, the look at of the, the look gives you the kind of uh, objects that were stored in these two rooms some ivory art artisans and then you have the chinese lacquer box the chinese lacquer bowl that is from the western Han. i'm com coming to that shortly so some ivory artisans were itinerant they were moving from one place to another suggesting that the carvers of the begram ivory and bone objects could have moved to and worked in begram as a part of the silk roads trade in the region some of the stylistic components of the ivory and bone objects point to the extreme northwestern region of Gandhara, indicating established ivory artisanship, at least that far north. Whether or not Begram was an active manufacturing site, the nature of the objects found there, when viewed against the backdrop of Begram's geographical location, suggests the site's place in the patterns of movement along the ancient trade routes between India and the regions of the West and the Far East. Stylistic comparison of the Chinese lacquers to similar finds from sites in Mongol Mongolia. So these are the Chinese lacquer boxes that were found. And Korea demonstrate that Chinese lacquers uh, uh, demonstrate that they were manufactured in China during the Han Dynasty, which means that they traveled via the Silk Roads along the through Begram and they moved to uh, down to Begram. So another reason may have existed why considerable trade moved through Begram. And this um, uh, uh, Sanjot Mehendale has observed that Central Asia in general and the Begram area in particular may have had local products cultivated, manufactured or existing naturally, which were valued, even coveted by the Roman, Chinese and Indian worlds and which were traded for goods uh, such as those discovered at Begram. So considering Begram as a storage and redistribution site, the delays between the arrivals and departures of various traders and caravers occasioned by the slow, difficult and irregular travel of the age and region would have made it necessary for goods to be stored away safely for relatively long periods of time. The fact that the goods traveled from diverse distant places and were stored together suggests that the place of storage was a point either of consumption, of storage for further distribution or of active trading. Along with Bactria and Begram, there were some other sites like Kandahar, Charsada and Taxila in the Indo-Iranian borderlands, which also participated in this network of distribution of the Silk Road as a node for transit trade due to its location. I will just uh, land. This is a very beautiful goblet, um, uh, which talks about the abduction of uh, the Greek story about the abduction of Europa. And this is the Indian ivory furniture support, which is found, which is uh, found from uh, Begram, and it said that it has a similar kind from Pompeii. Now. <clears throat> Along with um, so the existence of trading and their halting stations for traders in different parts of the empire is perhaps suggested by ruins of a number of settlements of the age like those to the north of the um, uh, Kabul River on the Pushkalavati Taxila Road. Here I would briefly um, talk about the Karakoram Highway, which linked the upper Indus region with China. Now, um, I don't have much time to discuss the Karakoram Highway, but it is a very important uh, highway that linked China with the upper Indus region, as you can see. And there were important centers like Chilas, Gilgit. Uh, we are all aware of the Gilgit manuscripts and a lot of uh, manuscripts have been found from this region. So this happened, this was, uh, this was a route which was very much active during the time of the Kushanas. So uh, when we are studying the Kushana network, we have to also bring into consideration the Karakoram Highway and the petroglyphs that the highway shows. So here we have from Chilas this uh, petroglyph where you can see a stupa and a person who is a worshipper and he is actually wearing a Central Asian attire. So whether he is a Kushana or not, we do not know. But that the people from Central Asian region moved into this uh, area and where there was a constant movement of different and we have different kinds 
kinds of um, languages also we have Bactrian, Sogdian in the later period from the fourth, fifth centuries. Beautiful uh, inscription uh, pictures and uh, Sogdian inscriptions have been found. Even Brahmi here it is the Karoshti inscription. So you can see the veneration of a stupa. So it has a Buddhist uh, kind of bearing and how uh, the simple stupa with the anda and the chatrabali. Then we find the people, uh, the horse traders. And this is important because it shows that Kashmir, Jibin, uh, as mentioned in the Chinese annals, was very much a part of the Kushana Empire. And so this was also known as the Kashmir route. So men in Central Asian attire with horses. So they were perhaps the horse traders because and we can find that so they could be uh, Kushan horse was an important item of trade and we know from the southeast uh, the Chinese texts they talk of very important blood sweating horses from Fargana uh, which came from the Fargana was the breeding place in and from Fargana they move into in the Indus region into northwest India and so therefore, uh, the starting of the horse trade was also very active during the time of the Kushanas. So when we look at these people who were perhaps traders, because there is a difference, we have another picture. Uh, this is also we find uh, uh, in the petroglyphs of the Chilas and Hunza Valley. Here we have also horses. Uh, but they have been uh, identified as they were perhaps uh, soldiers who were also moving from through this region. So therefore, uh, among the while we study the network of the Kushan Empire, the Karakuram Highway Network cannot be left out. And this is also very important. Moreover, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going into that today. In Sokotra, we all know that in the Sokotra Islands, courtesy the hard work of Ingo Strauss, uh, we have a lot of inscriptions. Indic, 200 Indic inscriptions have been found in Sokotra. And there we have the term like Devaputra, which we all know that the Kushanas were known as Devaputra. So the Shatrapa, then we have uh, Shatrapa written there. So and of course, uh, it talks about traders uh, going from Bharukacha, that is Barugaza, which was very much in the trading network of the Kushan Empire. So uh, if we look at their networks, it was vast. And for an empire, it was very promising. And therefore, it was also very prosperous area. So talking about this networks uh, and this overview, which I gave, of a vibrating trading network within the Kushan Empire in South Asia and beyond indicates the prosperity of the Kushana realm, as I just mentioned. This sets the stage for profusion of donative records in the Kushana world. Donative records across South Asia give us an idea of the nature of population in the empire when images uh, here, I'd like to just briefly talk about the Sanchi donative records from Sanchi, the donative records from Bharat. Uh, we all know that how we have references to professions, to the places. Uh, from where these people had come, they mentioned their places, they mentioned their profession. I and mean, we had the women donors who also talks about the places from which they come. So uh, though the in Mathura and other places, the donative records uh, during the Kushan time is not as profusely, uh, there is no profusion as Sachi or Bharat, but we have a substantial number of donative records which can give us an idea uh, of the uh, society or societal position or the nature of the population in the empire. When images of Buddha were being donated, the pedestal became the space to engrave the epithets of the Kushana ruler. Date, donor's name, type of object, and list of beneficiaries. Though I mentioned in the beginning, I would like to also uh, re reiterate here that all these inscriptions were not issued by the Kushana rulers. There were inscriptions which were issued by the nobility, and but they all talk about the reign. I'm taking those inscriptions to talk about the reign of the Kushana ruler. They mention the name of the ruler under which they are uh, presently residing. So, and there are also donative records by the common people, the traders, the, the different people from the different, uh, pursuing the different professions. So there was 
then that there was an increase in the donative activity is found um, uh, uh, that was of course facilitated by the empire so uh, when images of buddha were being donated the pedestal as i mentioned becomes the space to engrave the epithets of the kushana rulers date and other things uh, so this was possible because uh, and this burgeoning donations of images or stupas and uh, in uh, karoshti inscriptions uh, i always um, in my classes as to say the donation of stupa and kupa kupa means well so you have numerous inscriptions in karoshti which talk about the kupa donation of kupa which gives you merit because you are trying to bring in water at koshambi sarnath and sravasti we have such um, uh, seven foot tall bodhisattvas which were erected on a promenade and it's called chankrama and they would have been fully visible to the monastics living within these viharas and inherently attractive to the lay community who wish to witness such an imposing image so here is a donation from a bhikshu and these are donated by the monks uh, bhikshu bala uh, his name is bala uh, the donation of bhikshu bala from sarnath <clears throat> let me show you yeah. uh, so this is another uh, this huge um, uh, images and here uh, in the donation of bhikshu bala we have here we have um, uh, inscriptions also in the shaft and then there was the the top of the shaft was the uh, umbrella the chhatra so what uh, we find is that um, these uh, were fully visible to monastics living within these viharas and inherently attractive to the lay community who wish to witness such an imposing image the nan buddha mitra and monk bala who donated the standing bodhisattvas are both identified as tripitaka one who is versed in the tripitaka interestingly early buddhist texts do not mention tripitaka or tripitaka i owe this information to my uh, young friend uh, prita bhattacharya of the department of ancient indian history and culture calcutta university although the primary donors of these objects were monastics the inscription on the sarnath bodhisattva mentions that it was installed with that is shaha the mahashatrapa kharapallana and the shatrapa vanaspara so you can see the names the names are not uh, the um, indic names kharapallana vanaspara whether these officials personally had this image installed in the monastery is unclear but this text does suggest that this standing bodhisattva was intended to be seen by more than just the monks inhabiting the monastery so commonality in posture and other sculptural idioms suggests that the sculptors were trained in a common school of art the standardization which is a marker of an empire was visible here at sarnath we have the bodhisattva dedicated by bhikshu bala of the year 3 of the reign of kanishka now if you see this so here you have written in brahmi uh, it talks about maharajasya kanishkasya so it it gives you the inscription uh, it is so it's inscribed and we know that it is during the time of kanishka first sorry i i think i had yeah uh, this is just to show you and i'll come to this later on again that how in the pedestals in the different areas how the inscriptions were inscribed uh, which helps us to understand the the nature of the donations and also the name of the donors the purpose of the donation sometimes they are also given <clears throat> uh then i'm to, i i'm going to another inscription um but before that let me tell you that the these inscriptions when you see the 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 important the imposing images uh it shows and the inscriptions demonstrate uh, that the buddhist communities were actively sponsoring donations in both northern india and gandhara in the reign of kanishka first creating a religious network that connected the two regions so we had the trade network and here the religious network is also being connected in the reign of kanishka in the buddhist site of palikera a stone slab records the construction of a village temple the term used is harmia 
donated in the northern navamika uttaram navamikayam that was intended to please the goddess mentioned as priyatama devi this is very interesting of the village so it is a kind of a uh, drama devata which we find later in uh, the orissa region and the nearby region but in so uh, interestingly the term used for temple is harmia mention of priyatama devi is significant this indicates presence of worship of a local divinity who was not integral to buddhist jain or common brahmanical fold and thus was the favorite deity of the village now uh, harmia for temple is uh, somewhat new here because uh, we find in other inscriptions for example the famous mart inscription a uh, mart is near mathura where you have the kushana dynastic sanctuaries uh, it is known as the devakula so it was known as the mart devakula which is the sanskrit word for the bactrian uh, house of gods that is bagolago which we find in surkotal and also in the rabatak inscription among the different types of donation architectural pieces also may be mentioned a female figure was found at mora near mathura and this is undated unfortunately i don't have the picture but the inscription states that the donor was the wife of kalapala of mathura and the image is presumably of a figure named tosha that uh, kalapala is a wine distiller the exact nature of this inscribed object is also uncertain looters who actually gave us a list of uh, this inscription suggests tosha might be a local goddess the tosha inscription contains a phrase an image of tosha that is pratima toshaye pratima so we you have the you, uh, word pratima here dc sharkar opines that kalapala could be something similar to kalyapala that's as i mentioned the wine distiller he could be a rich merchant enabling his wife to make generous donations and this is quite plausible as considering the fact that we have evidence from mathura on consumption of wine uh, there are lots of evidence i'm going to show you the pictures uh these are the pillars and the way the pillars were they were in the red sikri stone uh, red stone which was dotted white and we find them also in sanghol and here you can see a, a lady holding a pitcher where perhaps uh, it's a wine pitcher uh, but interestingly what i would like to say is that uh, that we have also reference uh, to the two different uh, scenes uh, where uh, greek vessels were being shown and uh, also it uh, it perhaps uh, indicates that there is there was a some kind of dionysiac influences in mathura and it could have appealed to the lay worshipper regarding wine drinking another interesting sculpture housed in the mathura museum uh, draws our attention here we find a pot-bellied man seen enjoying wine you can see the wine cups uh, enjoying uh, wine and which uh, actually uh, if you look at the sculpture closely uh, this is served by a lady uh, in an ornamental wine drinking cup the dress of the attendants shows hellenistic influence so look here you they are wearing a kind of a chiton and uh, you have or uh, some kind of a central asian thing uh, a little different from the indian attire but the pot bellied man is seen scantily clad in indian attire and seated on a rocky based in a relaxed posture now um, there is a tendency when we see somebody with a pot belly uh he is generally identified we always have this um tendency to uh, go for an, for a religious uh, identification and therefore scholars have tried to uh, or tended to call him as kubera uh, because of his pot belly but to my mind he is just a wealthy person from mathura enjoying the simple pleasure of wine drinking because uh, and uh, this is not very uh, closely seen but the the cup is very decorated and you have this representations of such decorative cups in other sculptures also from gandhara and others so these are the wine cups hmm. the portrayal of the attendants in hellenistic attire suggests the heterogeneous population of mathura mathura was a very cosmopolitan city uh, urban center 
Hellenistic trends percolated here through the Indoscythians. Uh, we have Indoscythian rule in Mathura. Agilisis, we know that Agilisis uh, was ruling in Mathura. Then we have the Shodasha, Rajuvala, the Western Shatrapas of Mathura. So epigraphic records of Mathura mention also dancers and actors. A few panels of sculpture depict not only simple scenes of merrymaking and drinking, but also of lust and orgy. Uh, wine drinking. So these are the simple scenes. If you look at it, you can see that here uh, the lady is uh, completely drunk and uh, she is perhaps not ready to go. And the man is pulling her. And there is another uh, young person who is having uh, his hand uh, in his mouth. And perhaps it's a kind of an awe that what is happening, uh, he is watching. So these kind of sculptures. Uh, give us an idea of the kind of uh, life of pleasure uh, that was also prevalent in the society. Uh, I have another one. This is uh, also another very important sculpture uh, that we have uh, from Mathura. And here also, again, we find a boisterous woman. It's, a, it's a, in a drunken state uh, being actually tried, being uh, taken, and perhaps the child is there. Uh, there is another example. This is um, uh, where uh, you find that you have representation, perhaps a Ganika, we do not know. And then we have this um, here again, uh, she is in a lustful position or she is in a drunken state. So these uh, kind of uh, portrayal uh, of, uh, can be seen that women in a drunken state uh, are represented in few sculptures. And therefore, it shows a kind of an inclination of the society. A very interesting image inscription from Mathura refers to a woman as Kamuki. And this was published by Harry Falk. Uh, as, and he translates is that the name Kamuki, he translates it as lustful woman. Wine and lust go hand in hand. And we have seen sculptures from Mathura with, uh, the, there were back in alien scenes also, or Dionysiac scenes. So these orgiastic activities were very much a part of the social life of Mathura. So there was this cosmopolitan ambience. There was the contact with the Hellenistic regions of Northwest India. And so the constant movement of people and others, uh, 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 the monks, uh, the merchants and others. So therefore, they were impressed by also this kind of wine drinking publicly in the public sphere was happening. And they are displayed in the sculptures. So in this milieu, it is not surprising that a wine distiller. So uh, when we see that I, am, I showed the sculptures, remember, I showed the sculptures in the context of that inscription where the wine distiller's wife is donating. So now if you look at this milieu, that there was a lot of consumption of wine. And in Sanghol, uh, th that uh, area, people have, uh, Ardhindurai has worked on this. And um, the reference to uh, grapes and have been found, archaeologically have been found. So now, so it is not surprising that the wine distiller would earn enough money to uh, donate. And here again, one may also mention an inscription of uh, uh, not exactly of the Kushan period, but of the pre-Kushan period. And uh, this has been published by uh, Gorisha Bhattacharya. And um, so uh, we find that there is, and this is in a Jaina context. And here we, the inscription, it records the name of the donor as Yashak, Yashaka, son of Kashi or Kotshi, uh, during the reign of the rule, Surya Mitra, son of Gopali. I'm thankful to my colleague from the Department of Archaeology, Rajat Shannal, University of Calcutta, for drawing my attention to this essay. Uh, the here, but I have developed these thoughts a little bit. Uh, the Yeshoka was the intimate companion. Then we have this term called Peter Martha of the king. I'll come to this in a while. Uh, it states Ramya Gopalya. Putrasa, Surya Mitrasa, Pitha Mardena, Kasi Putrena, Yashakena, Karitam. So this inscription or this donation was done by Yashaka, who was a uh, who was a Pitha Martha. Pitha Martha is an uh, it's an actually it's a libertine, uh, the intimate uh, companion. Uh, 
just as the uh, if we look at um, the the counselors the friends of the kings just as the mantrins advise the king and it is there in the arthashastra also just as the mantrins advise the king in the political arena the vitas and the pithamardanas advised him in matters of love so so and we have reference to them in the texts also the the kavyas the kama sutra gives a description of a pithamarda or a libertine and um, thus love wine drinking and orgy was very much present in the society of mathura and the kings or the nagaragas they were they moved always with the pithamarda and so this is very interesting in the context of mathura in inscriptions i do not have uh, knowledge of any inscription which talks about the pithamarda we generally find it in the text so in the context of mathura it is important because you have this culture uh so uh, the culture of a nagaraka the culture of uh, the ruler having a libertine is very much present in also in the mathura area uh then uh, we have uh, some other inscriptions also there is in this context one can also talk about an undated dedicated uh, dedicatory inscription uh, which records that it was set up by a ganika Uh, Vasu, daughter of Ganika Labana Shobhika, together with her mother, her daughter, her son, and her whole household, in honor of the Arhats. It is again in the Jain context. Uh, the mother and daughter both were courtesans, but they did not prevent them. But that 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 they were courtesans did not prevent them making this religious donation. And while the mother is called Arya or noble. the daughter is designated as a shramana shravika or disciple of the ascetics so they left their perhaps they left their profession of a courtesan and joined the order the non buddhist um, uh, but uh, uh, no, sorry one second so another uh, in this context i should also refer to another inscribed seated bodhisattva installed in the year 17 by the lay follower nagapiya Uh, the wife of the gold nagapiya the wife of the goldsmith dharamaka uh, dharamaka dharamaka sa uh, shobhanika so uh, kutubena upashika nagapiye bodhisattva pratithapiti so uh, shobhanika uh, shobhanika is the uh, is the uh, jeweler uh, thus here the profession of the husband of the doni is also referred to among the occupational groups goldsmiths were they, uh, they were suvarnakaras as we know were high up on the social ladder and were wealthy too hence it was important to mention the occupation of the husband of the doni who commanded respect in the society because this is did not happen always sometimes we have that uh, the um, occupation of the husband of the doni is not always mentioned the non buddhist deities also contained inscriptions we have an image of the naga lord bhuma donated by uh, this is also very interesting because the epithet it is said niya vadaki vadaki is from vardhaki uh, the carpenter or a wood uh, who works on wood a niya vadaki of mathura mathurasya niya vadikasya the niya term niya vadaki is again enigmatic however he could be a vardhaki that is and his computer uh, that is a carpenter and his sponsorship of this naga object demonstrates that this religious community existed in mathura at this period and they were being patronized presumably by persons from the occupational group now the prefix niya is difficult to explain i have a very wild suggestion i'm absolutely not sure about this uh but it niya niya it takes me to uh the niya in sankli um uh, the niya region where uh, we have um, we know that um, it's linked to central asia chinese central asia where which was the niya region which was famous for wooden slip written in karushti oral stein had actually recovered these um uh, and these were woodwork wooden slip written in karushti which is proficient in woodwork and also knowledge of a script from the northwest um so i was just wondering uh, whether we can think of 
this Nia Anya Vadaki is at some Vardaki who is originally from Nia and now lives in Mathura. So Nia Vardaki, so his identification as a Vardaki because who works on wood is um, is referred to as well as now he is from Mathura, so Mathura Sia. But that is of course I do not have enough um, uh, ample things, uh, ample example to substantiate. There may be more uh, lay donors attributable to this period because the inscription on an uh, undated seated Kapardin Buddha found at Jamalpur Mound in Mathura contains what appears to be a list of donors, but the text is extremely eroded and the list of names is only partially legible. This inscription shows that images were sponsored by groups. Now, these are the Kapardin Buddhas. Uh, they were called Kapardin Buddhas. I have another image which I'll show because of the, uh, the style of their head. From Song was donated. Then we have this inscription which was donated by Pushya, Pushya Datta, the daughter of the Gora, Gunda, sorry, the daughter of Gunda, the lord of the Vihara, Vihara Swami. According to Gregory Chopin, a Bihara Swami is believed to designate the lay owner of the Bihara who performed functions that monks, according to Vinaya codes, were not allowed to engage in, such, a, such as owning property. So this inscription also tells us that Pushyatada installed a seated Buddha in her own Vihara, Swake Viharo, showing that affluent donor, donor could have their own personal space within the monastic setting. So they had, they could have their own uh, independent space for worship. This indicates the presence of the donor within the sacred space. Chopin's view that donors could claim ownership over a Vihara is very important. And that seems to suggest that monasteries were accessible to the public. In these inscriptions, three viharas are identified in and around Mathura. The Hakya Vihara, the Kashtikya Vihara, and the unnamed Vihara in Song, managed by Gunda and patronized by his daughter. During Hovishka's time, two inscriptions referred to occupational groups, particularly, uh, particularly merits mention. The first is a statue of uh, Shoroshuti found at the Jain complex of Kankali Tila. Uh, this is, yeah. This is a very archaic um, Saraswati that has been found. Uh, the donor of this inscribed image from Kankalitela is Gova, who is identified as an ironsmith. So he's called Lohiko Karukasya Danam, indicating that professionals donated objects to both Jain and Buddhistic monastic complexes. Now, if we look at this image, of course, it is a very early image. We find that we have only the manuscript but the veena, which is uh, which becomes a very much a part of um, Swarasati, is uh, strangely absent here. It's not there. Uh, the second donation is of particular interest in the history of the Kushan Empire and the socio-religious uh, setting of Mathura in the early CE. The inscription tells us that the, in the year twenty-eight on the first day of Gorpiaios. Now, Gorpiaios is a Macedonian month, and we have several instances in the Kushana records where this Macedonian months, like Panemasa, Artemisia, uh, these were actually used in the inscriptions. So here we find that on the first day of Gorpiaios, an Eastern or Old Hall of Merit was given a perpetual endowment by the son of Kanak, uh, please mind, uh, remember, uh, listen carefully the name Kanasarukamana, the Lord of Kharasalera, and an official in charge of temple. And the official in charge of temple is known as Vakanapati. And we have reference to these in other inscriptions as well. The endowment is of 550 Puranas in each of the two guilds. Puranas, the unit of um, uh, money, in each of the two guilds of flower makers, Samitakara and another word which is broken and another guild. Significantly, and here I would like to draw your attention, the term Samitakara owes its origin 
to elamite and this we learn from the persepolis fortification tablets i was going through these tablets and i i was uh, thrilled to find that it it has such kind of similarity which was cited earlier this persepolis fortification tablets um, uh, we have this so among the travel rations and these tablets talk about the travel rations a major commodity was flour as it was the staple food for that region the text referred to samida kuraki flower makers mentions that 4.8 bar of flour was received by one bakaparna who was a samida maker thus it appears that samita kara is a transliteration of samida kuraki the word samita is absent in the vedic corpus but later on made its entry in the sanskrit language the samita karas are also included in the list of gilds given in the mahavastu the inscription shows that it had an iranian context as both the place name khara salera and the name of the lord kana sarukamana suggest a bactro iranian background such movement of words or vocabulary as we know there are many happens on happens only with regular interactions this inscription is also an interesting example of linguistic interface in the kushana period moreover this text indicates that right at the beginning of huvishka's reign a kushan official extended imperial support to the brahmanical community in mathura huvishka himself is mentioned in his, this inscription as one of those along with his associates who benefits from the rewards of the merit hall donation whatever merit there is here may that be for the devaputra shahi huvishka and also to those to whom the devaputra is there so tam devaputra sya shahi sya huvishka sya the architectural types of inscribed objects donated in the reign of huvishka consist of an example of donation by a sarishti found at kankalitila it reads in the year 38 winter month 3 day 11 of the great king the devaputra huvishka on this occasion the nandi vishala that is an elephant was installed by the sreshti the rich merchant the noble rudrashena son of the sreshti sivadasa so uh, here for the honor of the arhats so this inscription is a fine example to suggest heredity in occupation and the wealth of the family of sreshti rich merchant accumulated to make such donations along with this two pillar based donations by the same brothers merit attention the brothers are buddha rakshita and dharma rakshita who are identified as upashakas from taxila whose father was a brahmana one of the pillar based inscription reads in the year 33 of the great king the devaputra huveshka in the first month of the winter season on the second day on this day this pillar base kumbha is the gift of the two buddhist laymen buddha rakshita and dhamma rakshita brothers of sons of shoma brahmanas of the opamanyava gotra hailing from takshashila a gift in their own monastery connected with water it is given to the acceptance of the sarvastivadin teachers for the bestowing of health on themselves for the veneration of their mother and father for longevity of their sons and daughters for the welfare and happiness of all beings the two brothers come from a brahmana family preserving their gotra affiliation there are two other known cases of brahmanas mentioning their gotra in mathura inscriptions but both occur clearly in a brahmanical context this makes the takshashila brothers all the more exceptional also shomaputra seems to refer to the brother's father bearing a name with a brahmana connotation in spite of the brahmana background they are firm buddhist devotees in the second generation their father shoma seems to have been converted and gave his children buddhist names buddha rakshita and dharma rakshita thus rich people from taxila came to the kushan came to mathura to own a monastery indicating a regular mobility among people living within the kushan empire again an architectural piece in the form of a stone slab contains the donation a uh, donative inscription which reads in the year 50 rainy month 4 day 5 on this occasion puroha shalaka the son of the caravan trader leader indrabala that is sartavaha indrabala the brother of bhavadina 
So here we have a Sarthavaha as a donor. Again, I would like to draw your attention to another interesting donation is that of a standing Buddha donated in the year 45. It reads as in the year 45, rainy month, uh, three day 15 of the great King Huvishka, the Devaputra on this occasion, an image of the incomparable Lord Sakyamuni was installed by the female lay follower Kavishcha at Alika in the Losika Vihara for the benefit of her own health and for the welfare and happiness of her parent, parents of Shamanika's mother, Bhattarika, of Shamanika, of Jivaka, the mother of Jivaka. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Jivaka, the mother of Jivaka, and of all beings that contains the names of six individuals, uh, the primary donor also uh, being the lay follower Kavishicha, and her additional five relatives who benefited from the gift. So this um, in, uh, uh, inscription of Kavishicha is also very interesting because here you have the protection uh, of uh, the the, uh, the Buddhist order, and then there is another uh, important inscription which talks about, which is a uh, but let me, uh, yeah, Amohashi. This is Amohashi called Amohashi Buddhist a Bodhisattva from Mathura. Uh, this image of the Buddha were called Bodhisattva or Bodhisattva and not Buddha from the early years of the Kushana ruler Kanishka first. Um, why this is not called uh, Buddha is uh, not known. And Gorisha Bhattacharya says also that is quite puzzling. And so there is, and there is no satisfactory explanation. Uh, one of the reasons offered by him is that that Mathura Buddhists were rather orthodox to call the image straight as Buddha. So they might have been influenced by Buddhist texts which describe Siddhartha as Bodhisattva till he attained the Bodhi. Strangely enough, although the image is called Bodhisattva, the son of the female donor is called Buddha Rakshita, that is protected by the Buddha. The female donor of the image in question was perhaps a lay worshipper, mother of Buddha Rakshita, perhaps a Buddhist monk, and the name is Amohashi or Amogadasi. So the name ending Dasi in, uh, signifies people that she was a signifies that she was a woman of the lower stratum and perhaps that is why her son had embraced Buddhism uh, but uh, uh, but of course this is a conjecture and we do not know we have um, another inscription uh, from uh, I'm, I'm, I would like to talk about another inscription of during the time of Kuvishka. Uh, which is a striking record of Amitabha Buddha uh, image bearing uh, inscription from Govind Nagar. It says that the image of Amitabha was installed by Nagarakshita. Yes, uh, this is the pedestal where you have that's broken. And this is just to show you that how the pillar in the uh, pillar base we used to have, there was to have the inscription. Uh, so uh, it says that the image of Amitabha was installed by Nagarakshita, who was the son of Buddha Bala and grandson of the caravan trader Shattako and grandson from the mother's side of the rich merchant Balakitti for the worship of all Buddhas. This inscription gives us an interesting insight into a familial relationship, which is pronounced in the records, perhaps in order to establish the pedigree of the donor. Surprisingly, the profession of the donor and his father is not mentioned. The silence leads to the question whether they belong to any occupational group. But it is quite evident that donation of this huge sculpture needs enough wealth, needed enough wealth, and it is possibly possible generally uh, by royal merchants, generally by royalty or merchants. Thus, this family of Sartavaha and Sreshtin were financially capable of making such large donations from donations. So therefore, we have references to the familial, uh, the, the kind of a re, uh, relationships. Uh, then from Konkalitila also, we have the gift of another ironsmith, Lohokarika, Gotiko, and that of the wife of a cotton dealer, Karpashaka, who installed uh, giant images. 
one buddhist nan ghanavati is of interest on uh, is interest as the inscription that records her installation of a seated bodhisattva in the year 33 states that she is the niece bhaginiyi of the nan buddha mitra who sponsored the series of standing bodhisattvas in kosham and sarnath in kanishka first third year so you have the links the relationships uh, which now uh, is uh, quite evident when you look at these inscriptions in a proper uh, chronological or in a proper um, uh, in a serious man manner and with uh, with a kind of a judicious choice of looking at the texts uh, one monk jivaka who donated a pillar base is identified as coming from udyana odyanaka which is most likely the swat valley where the odi kings ruled in the time of kujula katfisis and this inscription shows that monks traveled between monastic sites at this time during the reign of vasudeva we have interesting donations which throw some light on the social practice of the time i am coming to the end of my talk we learn about the donation of perfumers gandhikas one of the inscriptions state about the donation of mitra the daughter in law of the perfumer varuna the daughter of the cloak maker pravaraka this is an indication of the marital relations between two occupational groups of perfumer and cloak maker among the jain community the demand of the cloak maker was perhaps among the elites of mathura the other professionals mentioned are familiar from the texts a shreshthin named riteko and a goldsmith named deva whose daughter donated a vardhamana uh, image then we have also reference uh, to uh, to uh, bodhisattva being installed in jetavana of shravasti uh, this is wrong. yeah uh, jetavana of shravasti and uh, and uh, it says that shivadhara the kshatriya brothers from vilishta and sons of dharmananda from mathura Uh, so this charitable gift is for the welfare of all living beings uh, with special regard to their parents to help accumulate merit for this world and merit for the next uh, the bodhisattva was made by shiva mitra the sculptor of uh, mathura so this is important because here we find the reference to the uh, sculptors uh, of the, the the name of the sculptor is given were called shaila rupakara so it is like shaila rupakara uh, in in, in um, this is written in epigraphical hybrid sanskrit and so it is called shaila rupakara um, and this is from shravasti but it talks about the uh, movement of um, this uh, uh, this uh, carvers uh, from mathura and because the the sons of dharmananda from mathura so the donation of two kshatriya brothers sons of dharmananda from mathura coming into uh, shravasti is also quite interesting uh, people so uh, and also uh, the fact that the kshatriyas embraced buddhism in this region uh, at this that point of time uh so what we find uh, these are the the kind of references which i uh, or the inscriptions which i wanted to discuss with you uh so what we find is that um when we look at these uh, uh when we look at this wide range of donors identified um in the select inscriptions represents the donative spheres associated with monastic sites throughout the kushan empire with the buddhist community be being all encompassing but of course the jains particularly in kankali tela they were very uh, important uh, donors names and their affiliations serve as vital pieces of information for reconstructing a narrative of the kushana period like dharmaka's wife nagopiya is it must be remembered is the only donor of this period who specifies that she is a lay follower she calls herself an upashika in a donative text making her affiliation with the buddhist community secure and proving that at least the wives of professionals were patronizing buddhist monastic sites um, like they were uh, patronizing buddhist monastic sites it is apparent from these records that within the kushana empire jain and buddhist monastic sites in mathura 
continued to receive a steady stream of patronage from common man. It is natural that the largest class of donors is Buddhist, and therefore they received maximum donation. The Jains were a new group of donors, largely active during the time of Puvishka and Vasudeva. But surprisingly, in the Kushana coins, we have no representation of any Jain deity, uh, though Buddha and Maitreya are represented. Apart from the pedestal for images, pillar bases were also used for writing the donative records that we have seen. So the vibrant interregional network of the time is evident from some of the donations, uh, which suggest movement of professionals and monks. Uh, the records are also pointed to the urban milieu of the period, and it appears that the, the, the rigidity of the Varna system, which engulfed the society in general, was not much into uh, prevalence in, uh, this, uh, in the, within the Kushana territory. Uh, so, um, uh, therefore, uh, uh, in spite, and they were actually, if you read Ashwagosh also, they were, they were a scathing uh, attack on the Varna system. So, uh, the society, uh, the, when we look at the donative records, we find that there are uh, instances where the society is accepting uh, donations and the society is also uh, looks at this not very much adhering to the Varna system, but of course uh, it needs the Varna. The um, I'm I did not touch upon the Varna part today, Varna Jati part today, because it needs further uh, further uh, study on my part. But I wish to look at uh, the societal experience also from the point of view of the Varnashrama Dharma that we find in the um, in early India. Uh, but when we look at this uh, judici uh, these donative records, and I feel that if they are studied judiciously, this can provide insights into the social and religious life of South Asia within the Kushana world, which was multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and pluralistic. And so therefore, uh, the Kushana world in South Asia was different from the Kushana world that we can perceive in Central Asia. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and bearing with me. It's uh, practically, I think, one hour. Thank you, ma'am, very much uh, for this excellent speech. And we have been really very introduced to have such an amazing lecture. So we proceed to the question and answer session. Yeah. So are you going to read it for me or I will do that? I will read it, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so first question is from uh, Shubhik uh, Shohal. Achha, just a minute, I would like to mention, I forgot to mention uh, that some of the inscriptions I owe from the unpublished doctoral thesis of Michael Skinner. He has given a list of the inscriptions. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. The question is from Shubhik Shohal. Do you think that the Kushanas consider the Indian subcontinent as a, as a melting pot? and integrated themselves in the larger social matrix. Can we identify them now in the social system by race, language, tradition, and culture? OK, this is a very good question, um, Mr. Sohal. And what I would like to, in the, at the very outset, I would like to mention that I don't see uh, the whole, the indo Iranian borderlands are the regions where the Kushanas lived as a melting pot. What is a melting pot? Melting pot means that everything comes and there's a confluence. Then the identity is lost. But in this case, for the Kushanas, we find that they had a very distinct identity of themselves. So they allowed the uh, identity of the locals. But at the same time, look at their, if you look at the Mathura sculpture, uh, the mat, uh, for example, from the mat, the Kanishka's dress and all. So they are typically Central Asian attire. Whereas if we look the, uh, at the sculptures from Bactria, we find that they are wearing a shalwar kind of things. So they were very conscious about their own identity, the Central Asian identity. And even if we look at the coins also, we find that whether uh, at, while they had accepted the local gods and goddesses, the Iranian gods and goddesses gets privileged. And in the, in the depiction also, the nomadic element, the way Vima Katfisa seats in the coins, the I wish I had the uh, pictures to show you, uh, there is a kind of a 
presence of the they have not forgotten the nomadic element so there is a presence of the nomadic element so long high boots long coats trousers these marks the kushanas and they actually in india they kept it in afghanistan on the other hand if we look at the surkotal image we find that they are in shalwars so there it was a difference in treatment and which i had actually uh shown that because they were uh, bactria was the area where they found themselves to be a part of the local population but in india in mathura they were trying to show that they were the masters and therefore they had their own kind of dressing and own kind of uh way so it is not a melting pot it's not an amalgamation but it is a uh, it is a kind of an acknowledgement the kushanas acknowledged the local cultures the kushanas in acknowledged the indigenous culture because to they knew that to have control over a vast area it was important for them to acknowledge the hybridity the pluralistic uh, element of the region okay ma'am the the next question is from shoikat mondol ma'am how was the trade between the eastern ports of india and with the china or the majority of trade was conducted through the land route oh, this is a very big question because it talks about the silk route trade networks uh, very briefly i can tell you that we have uh, uh, if you remember the map that i showed uh, the central asian silk road uh, the silk road starts from one place uh, chinkyan region and then it comes to lolang and from lolang there is the taklamakan des desert so it goes up the taklamakan desert down the taklamakan desert comes to kashgar so kashgar is the meeting point and then it comes to the uh, to the west uh, which goes to the parthian region now it is the kushanas who actually by controlling this region uh, they made uh, the south asia a part of the entire uh, the trade with the eastern roman empire so there were two ways uh the eastern uh, the ports um between the eastern ports of india uh okay you are talking about the eastern ports that means uh, you are talking about arika medu and other ports i suppose um um uh, shoikot anyway any, so the trade between the eastern ports of india and the han china there were two possibilities one was of course by the land route and one was the through the if uh, one has to look at it then through the maritime networks which crossed southeast asia and then moved into the chinese area but the the land the silk road was more important uh, in in this period of time okay ma'am the next question is uh... is from uh, shomrita mojumdar i am curious to know if you find any closeness between the images of yakshi dohada of bharut and shala banjika of sachi torana conception of uh, maya, maya devi in standing pose lolita bistara description of the event and and alasa kanya alasa dalo malika somrita uh, you have heard the heard the lecture uh, fascinating lecture by rajasri who talked about aloshokonna and dalomalika i am not an art historian so i would not um, prefer not to comment on this because you have this dohada yakshis of bharu the shalabanji cuz they have their own characteristics uh, what i would, i can say here is that from the point of view of a historian uh there is there are similarities in the depiction of the yakshis or yakshinis but in mathura if you look at mathura and sanghol uh the depiction is a little different because uh the way they stand you will find that a crouching human figure uh, uh in the uh, below and they stand on that so this is the uh this is what identifies the mathura uh, sculptures and also the sculptures of sanghol uh but um i'm sorry this um closeness between the images of i uh, i'm not capable of uh doing uh, commenting on that i'm not an art historian okay uh, the next question is uh, this is from sampurna chakraborty ma'am kushana uh, kushana amol gil shreni byabostha uh, byabostha somporke kichu jana kushana amole kushana amole an kore niche Okay. Uh, Kushan Amol's Gil Babustar Shampur ke kichhu jana jaye ki 
কুষাণদের বুদ্ধ এবং শিবের বিষ্ণুকে পেট্রোনাইজ করার ফলে ব্রাহ্মণদের প্রতিক্রিয়া কি ছিল আচ্ছা হ্যাঁ গিল সম্পর্কে খুব ভালো জানা যায় এই ইনস্ক্রিপশন গুলোতেই তো এই যে আমি সমিতা করদের কথা বললাম গোবিষ্কর ইনস্ক্রিপশনে শ্রেণীর কথা বলছে তো শ্রেণী ইস এজ ইউ মেনশন ইস গিল্ড কাজেই গিল্ড এর কথা খুব ভালো পাওয়া যায় এবং যেটা খুব ইম্পর্টেন্ট কুষাণ পিরিয়ড বিকজ দে ওয়ের ভেরি প্রো ট্রেড সো লট অফ গিল্ডস ওয়ের বিং অ্যাকচুয়ালি দে দে আর উই ফাইন্ড দ্য এক্সিস্টেন্স অফ অনেক বেশি গিল্ডের কথা আমরা পাচ্ছি ইনফ্যাক্ট তোমরা যদি রণবীর দার প্রাচীন ভারতের অর্থনৈতিক ইতিহাসের সন্ধানে পড়ো সেখানেও দেখবে উনি অনেক গিল্ডের কথা বলছেন শ্রেণী যেটা আমরা গিল্ড বলেন আমরা বলি গিল্ড লাইক শ্রেণী যেটা শ্রেণী গণ পুগ সংঘ তো এখানে কুষাণদের সময় যেহেতু এই গ্রুপ গুলো ছিল না তো আর্লি হিস্টোরিক পিরিয়ড এ গিল্ড শ্রেণী গুলো খুব পাওয়ারফুল ছিল যেটা গ্র্যাজুয়ালি আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি আর্লি মিডিয়াল পিরিয়ড এ নর্থ ইন্ডিয়ার ক্ষেত্রে গিল্ড লুজ দেয়ার আইডেন্টিটিস কারণ ওখানে অনেক বেশি কন্টেস্টেশন এসে যায় এন্ড যেহেতু যে কোয়েসিভ ক্যারেক্টার গিল্ডস এর জেনারেলি একটা কোয়েসিভ ক্যারেক্টার থাকে সে যেমন তাদের একটা জেঠক থাকে তারপরে কারিও চিন্তক থাকে এই কোয়েসিভ ক্যারেক্টারটা নষ্ট হয়ে যায় ডিউরিং দ্য আর্লি মিডিয়াল পিরিয়ড ইন কেস অফ নর্থ ইন্ডিয়া নট ইন কেস অফ দ্য সাউথ বাট ইন কেস অফ নর্থ এটা যে ভীষণ ভাবে ছিল এবং কুষাণদের বুদ্ধ এবং শিব আর বিষ্ণুকে পেট্রোনাইজ করার ফলে ব্রাহ্মণদের প্রতি প্রতি এদের আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি যে অনেক ডোনেশন গেছে মানে এই যে আমি মেনলি আজকে বুদ্ধিস্ট আর জেন ডোনেশন এর কথা বললাম কারণ আমি ওটাতে ফোকাস করেছি এবং আমি যে ধরনের সোসাইটির কথা বলতে চেয়েছি কিন্তু অনেক ব্রাহ্মণিক্যাল ডোনেশন আছে আর ডোনেশন পেলে ব্রাহ্মণদের তো খারাপ লাগার কথা নয় তারা তো খুশি হবে যে আহ কুষাণ রাজারা সাধারণ বুদ্ধিতেই আমাদের মনে হয় যে ব্রাহ্মণরা ডোনেশন পেলে খুশি হন কাজে তারা সেখানে কুষাণদের শিবের প্রতি ডোনেশন বা হুবিষ্ক হুবিষ্কর ক্ষেত্রে আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি হুবিষ্ক কিন্তু তার কয়নেও কার্তিকের খুব একটা এই যে ওয়ারিয়র গ্রুপ একটা কার্তিকের খুব আমরা স্কন্দ কার্তিকের ছবি পাচ্ছি পরে ইয়ের যে বাসুদেব আর কয়নে আমরা বাসুদেব কে পেয়েছি তো আমার মনে হয় যে সেখানে তাদের আলাদা করে তো কিছু লেখেননি ব্রাহ্মণ কোন টেক্সটে আমরা ওরকম পাই না বাট সাধারণ বুদ্ধিতে মনে হয় যে তাদের প্রতিক্রিয়া ভালোই হবে খারাপ হওয়ার তো কথা নয় কিন্তু আমাদের কাছে কোনো কিছু লেখা নেই কোনো সোর্স মেটিরিয়াল নেই যেমন ধরো ট্রাইবাল কয়েন্স বলা হচ্ছে আমরা সেটা এটা অ্যাকচুয়ালি নন মোনার্কিক্যাল গ্রুপদের কথা বলা হয় এই ইয়োধেয়াস মালাভাস গানাস সন্ধাস মানে এদেরকে বলা হচ্ছে সরি ক্যান ইউ টক ইট ইন ইংলিশ ক্যান ইউ টক ইট ইন ইংলিশ দ্য क्वेश्चन ওর দ্য क्वेश्चन वाज इन इंग्लिश या या यस मैम यस সো নাও the point is that when we look at uh, this um, uh, the different other groups so we have in the indian context the non monarchical groups who are designated as tribes ah, so we have the books called tribal coins because they have issued coins and these non monarchical groups are uh, the the yodhas the arjunayanas the malavas the kunindas so we have reference to these non monarchical groups and they were actually they were um, living or residing in the areas of the five punjab rivers and then first comes the indo greeks and the scythians and then why they were pushed by the kushanas they had to move towards the regions of rajasthan and one group kuninda went into the almora and other eastern himalayas region other came to rajasthan malwa corridor during the, the malwa areas so gradually this non monarchical group were quite resilient so they could make their presence felt because we have rudradaman's inscription the junagarh inscription where rudradaman says very categorically that he defeated the loathsome yodhyas 
so he were against the ayodhyas and they they were very because the ayodhyas are known as the ayudha jeevi shangha in panini so that means one who lives by the warfare the by the um, by warfare by the by the arms and again it can be assumed and i i feel that it can be that why huvishka had this um, intention of worshiping kartikeya skanda then uh, skanda uh, kartika uh, because the yodhyas were an important group at that time while the kushanas were there yodhyas were also there so they were also an important group and therefore perhaps and yodhya the god for yodhyas were the were kartika we have six at kartikeya in yodhya coins so therefore the the groups the soul tribal i would not we would not like to call it tribal because uh, there is a very interesting article by shirin ratnakar how she uh, shows that why it should not they should not be called tribal and because they were writing they had and gradually these groups uh, continued and they they moved into the monarchical form of government ramala thakpur calls them proto state upinder singh calls them uh, the oligarchical form of government uh so these were definitely there they were there and they tried they were resilient they stated they had an autonomous space i have an article called the ganashangas the migration of the ganashangas of punjab which was published in uh the journal of the asiatic society if you are further interested you can have a look at that okay ma'am this is the question from our uh, members Uh, the Srija Dotto asked, uh, "Ma'am, does the large number of donative records donated by women, the ownership of women deities, even though locally, hint towards some more liberal attitude towards the women in the Kushana period?" Yeah, I think so. I think so because the women were given, uh, though uh, we cannot like quote unquote, we can say the women were having a very good time or something like that in a in a society where there are a lot of restrictions for women. Uh, we cannot think that there were happening, but women donors are uh, available not only in Mathura or this area, but even from earlier times. There is a very important essay by Kumkum Roy. on the sachi women donors of sachi where she showed that how the women donors have donated and the regions and what was the nature that uh, from where they came and how uh, the nature of the inscriptions which they wrote but definitely i would like to believe that uh, the for example if uh, particularly the elites of course the elite women of course had their own um, space and when we look at the sculptures it is very interesting if you have noticed one of the sculptures uh, there were pillars and uh, the lady was there with uh, with this uh, wine pitcher perhaps and on the upper story these are the balconies and the balconies it's always the couple we have the couple so conjugality and this sense of conjugality is very much there in mathura and also in sanghol and that we find in the gandhara also so i would uh, think that considering uh, all these things that the presence of women in the balconies they are looking as they are there as onlookers which we find in gandhara too and the way we have the drunkard state of women uh, of course they were perhaps a uh, women uh, the ganikas uh, but uh, in uh, in a nutshell we can say that perhaps it was not so bad perhaps they had some kind of privilege and of course the daughter uh, of gunda who had a swakya space swake that she had a sacred space within the monastery so the elite women definitely had their own say they were but ordinary women also because there are a lot of uh, donations by i have uh, this is not the place and i'm not going i was not giving a list it is not i'm not, not making an inventory but you know the uh, there are a lot of donations by ganikas the shoyla lakas the dancers the singers that we find from the mathura inscription so it has um, it it is possible that uh, women were not so badly treated in the society okay ma'am uh, that is the question from anirban ghosh ma'am the play of the little clay cut or the mrichya potika is one of the greatest sanskrit play of that time do you think that the dramatic art influenced the sculpture art or the social practices of drinking is reflected in the the uh, theatrical arts as well as in the sculpture arts this is a very very uh, insightful question and there is always this uh, debate 
that which is earlier, the text or the art. So uh, in case of art, you know, there are two things. One, there is a Shastra. So you go by the Shastric norms, but there are popular arts, which is always not. For example, the Mathura women, uh, it is it it uh, transcends all kind of Shastras, the lustful woman. Uh, so it's not there. Now um, it is um, you you uh, you saw one of my um, one of my slides uh, where actually the that picture was taken by Donald Stantner, uh, a book actually she, he he took, takes this image and he thinks that this lady is Vasavadatta and so he writes the little clay card. So uh, I think that these are intertwined. Um, so you have this dramatic arts, the drama is there, and then uh, the description, of course, uh, you see, and then you create. So maybe in the eyes of the sculptor, they have noticed women like this, and uh, in this state of uh, inebriation, and they did, and this we find also in Gan Gandhara. So uh, the, the Shudrakas Mitchakatika is a unique play. It has all kind of layers. The kind of description it gives of a thief and the act of thievery is also fascinating. So uh, I, I think I uh, they had seen, the sculptors had seen something like that. And therefore, there was this reflection on the art. It has to be visualized. OK, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Aditya Shankar Chattopadhyay. He asks, uh, Kushana patron different religions in Central Asia and South Asia, and also made dynastic sanctuary dedicated to those de deities. This, did this religious process used to expand their dominance in different parts of Central and South Asia? Or did they use patronizing of different religions as a tool for expanding or recovering their dominance in different regions of Central and South Asia? Did this religious process use to expand their dominance in different parts of? Uh, actually, you know, the, this was the policy. First, there are two things. Di why dynastic sanctuary? So, dynastic sanctuary we find in the in South Asia we have only particularly if we uh, don't take Afghanistan as a part of South Asia, then we have only in Mathura. Otherwise, we have two dynastic sanctuaries. One is in Sulkotal, the other is in Rabatak. Rabatak, we have only the inscription which talks about the creation of Bagulaku, but we do not have in situ. But Sulkotal, we have in situ, the dynastic sanctuary. In Mat, also, we have we had this, um, uh, the Devakula of Mat, uh, the inscription talks about this. But there are uh, dynastic sanctuaries in other areas also. For example, Aitam in Central Asia. Uh, so there are so there this building of dynastic sanctuaries was a kind of a policy because uh, there was this idea of which Bhen Mukherjee had first initiated uh, that there was this idea of the cult of emperor. So the cult of empire and the cult of emperor. And when the Rabatak inscription uh, was um, uh, published, so he calls himself Bago, that is God himself. And then the the instruction is to make along with the deities, the deities which are mentioned in the inscription. So along with the deities, the images of his uh, like, and there only we find the names. So we get the genealogy that we have the name of Kujula Katfises, then we have the name of Vimataktu or Sadashkana, then we have uh, Vimataktu, then Vimakatfises, then Kanishka first. So the genealogy is there, and there uh, it is said that there should be images of the ancestors and his own image. So the whole idea was to have this cult of emperor and the empire. So having and patronizing different kind of religion was also a policy. To they had this huge empire, so through this they could have a, it could be a cementing factor. Therefore, in uh, in the context of India. We find representation of Iranian goddess, gods and goddesses, of some, a few, not much, Hellenistic gods and goddesses. Then we have Uma, we have uh, Bordo, we have Buddha also, Maitreya represented. So you have different. So there was a kind of perhaps uh, a sense of satisfying or uh, kind of taking, uh, acknowledging the different kinds of religious. 
uh, religions that were in practice in this area. And that's why I, for me, it is an enigma that why nothing from Jainism is represented in the coins. This is a big question to me because Kankalitila in Mathura was an important Jain center during the time of the Kushanas. But why did uh, the Kushanas did not represent a Jain in Tharkara in their coins? This is a uh, this is a question. So the dominance is, of course, as you rightly said, this religious process was linked with the establishment of the right and might, of course. And it is, don't forget that Kushanas were a military empire. So in their coins, so therefore you, there are deities also, which are their very abstract deities, like Pharaoh, uh, who is the royal glory, or you have Luaspo. Luaspo is, you find uh, a, a king, like a, a man uh, on, a, on, a, on a horse. So it is the fastest horse. So you have, so the horse is important. So the faster the horse goes. So you worship, you have there as a deity in your coins. Then you have Shaurorero. So this is the, the empire. So this kind of things is very much there in the uh, Kushana coins. So all this together actually makes up the mentality of the Kushana rulers. But particularly we have this variety only in the coins of Kanishka and Hubishka, Kanishka one and Hubishka. Okay, that is okay. another question from our live comment section. Uh, this is from Shagnik Bhattacharya. Can we identify any particular real political or reason why Kanishka decided to patronize Buddhism and was it any way connected to state legitimation and their imperial repertory? Repertoire. Repertoire. Okay, real politic is a very modern concept. So I wouldn't talk it real politic um, in that sense of the term. Uh, but of course, uh, patronizing Buddhism and uh, there, I don't, uh, uh, I think there was a kind of the sense, as you mentioned correctly, there was a kind of a legitimation uh, process that there was an attempt uh, to have legitimation and also. Uh, maybe there was um, a kind of uh, favoring because uh, they liked it. Uh, they, the, the essence of Buddhism, perhaps uh, they found it more acceptable for them. Therefore, otherwise, why would one have go for use the Purushapura, the, these monasteries you have, and the Buddhist councils, which we find. And if you read Ashokosha, also Buddha, uh, Buddha Charita, and when he talks about the Kushana period. So there is a kind of a, uh, the, I think two things were at play. One was, of course, the acceptance, the legitimacy, because they, after all, they were from outside. So they were uh, intervention, as Ramla Thapa rightly calls, we did call it that the Central Asian intervention in the Indian society. So intervention and so the acceptance. And at that point of time, Buddhism was flourishing a lot. So the Buddhist ideals mm -hmm. and Buddhism would have uh, accepted the Kushanas, accepted somebody from outside, which the Brahmanical religion would not. Uh, we know that. Uh, in, when we think of uh, the, um, the Kshatriyas, uh, for example, the Yavanas, the Yavanas were originally known as, um, first they were known as Shatshudras, then they were given the status of a Bratta Kshatriya, and Bratta Kshatriya, uh, which, and then they were brought into the fold as a Yajati's son. So uh, they were powerful, and so they wanted to accommodate. So therefore, the 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 Kushanas who were outsiders per se, so would not have got the kind of uh, favor that it received from Buddhism. And so they patronized also. Uh, Brahminical religion would never do that. Okay, ma'am. I think that's all. And thank you once again for giving your valuable time to our Facebook page. And thank you. Thank you very much. It's viewers. almost two hours. <laughs> it's almost two yes, hours. Right. Yes, ma'am. And also thank you to our viewers uh, for whom uh, we always get inspiration to organize uh, such lectures. Our next lecture is on 1st May on 11 a.m. by Sohel Asmi on the topic, is the Mughal garden inspired by the Quran or was there a different impetus? Please keep your eyes on our Facebook page for all the updates and also have a connection with our WhatsApp group, Telegram channel, YouTube channel and Instagram page for all the updates. And this video will be uploaded in the YouTube very shortly. 
Thank you once again, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. Thank, thank you, you viewers, and thank you uh, everyone for asking those very interesting questions. And uh, thank you, voyages into the past, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, Rakesh, personally for conducting it so well. Thank you. It was a pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's my pleasure. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you.